Hello everyone, welcome back to Z Physics. Today we're going to be talking about antiparticles and annihilation. Now, first off, what are antiparticles? Every regular particle has its antiparticle. And antiparticles have exactly the same mass but opposite charge. For instance, we have the electron, which is our regular particle, and that has a mass of 9.11 times 10 to the power of minus 31 kg and a charge of negative 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19. A positron is the antiparticle for the electron. It has a mass of 9.11 times 10 to the power of minus 31 kg, which is exactly the same as the mass or as the rest mass of an electron and it has a opposite charge which is plus 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19 coulombs. So the way we write down an antiparticle is normally with a little dash on top. For instance if we have the proton which is our regular particle the antiproton it's going to be written like so, just like a proton with a little dash on top. So this particle here, the proton, obviously has a charge of plus 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19, whereas the antiproton will be a negative particle with a charge of minus 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19, with exactly the same mass. And we could extend this to virtually any particle. For instance, um, let's say this here is the neutrino and the antineutrino will be written like this. Here's where it gets really interesting. When matter meets antimatter, annihilation occurs. This means that the entire mass of the two particles that have met one particle and one antiparticle is converted directly into energy, meaning photons. One of the most common questions is why does that happen? Well, if we were to describe the two particles, the um, particle and its antiparticles, they're actually going to have opposite what are known as quantum numbers. And if you do physics at university, you're going to be doing quite a lot about quantum numbers. The overall quantum number after the annihilation event when a particle interacts with an antiparticle is zero. And this means that normally photons emerge. Let's have a look at an example of this. Here's an example of a Feynman diagram showing an annihilation event. We have an electron and a positron interacting and the resulting annihilation produces two photons. Notice that the two photons are going to be traveling in, in a direction such as to conserve the original momentum. For instance, one here is going to the left and one here is going to the right. And overall, there the total momentum will be zero, assuming that the total momentum was zero before the collision. So what will the minimum energy of each of those photons be? And this is an incredibly typical question from the A-level physics specification. In order to calculate the minimum energy, we're going to use the most famous equation in the history of physics, E is equal to mc squared. In fact, because now we're talking about the change of energy and the change of mass, I'm just going to add couple of little deltas right here. The uh, total change in mass will actually be twice the electron mass because the electron and the positron have exactly the same mass so our total change in energy will be equal to twice the electron or the positron mass times c squared. And this over here is the energy, the total change of energy. Because we're trying to find the minimum energy of one photon, and they're going to be exactly the same, we can divide this by two in order to figure out the minimum energy of just one photon. So essentially the two is going to cancel out. So delta E will be just equal to the mass of an electron times C squared. We're ready to plug in some numbers. The mass of an electron is 9.11 times 10 to the power of minus 31 kg, and the speed of light is 3.0 times 10 to the power of 8 squared. 
And if we multiply everything out with a scientific calculator, we're going to get approximately 8.2 times 10 to the power of minus 14 joules. And this will be the minimum energy of each photon. We could also convert that to electron volts, which is quite a typical number. And um, the way we are going to do that, let's actually convert it to mega electron volts, will be by dividing by the electron charge. So let's convert it to mega electron volts. So it's going to be 10.6 times 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19, like so. And this is going to give us approximately 0.51 mega electron volts. We could take this a step further and calculate the wavelength of the photon that we are expecting for to come out out of this annihilation event or the frequency. Let's do the wavelength. Remember the, uh, the energy of a photon is given by the following equation E is equal to hc over lambda. Rearranging for the wavelength lambda, we're going to get that this will be equal to hc divided by the energy, which is equal to 6.63 times 10 to the power of minus 34 times the speed of light, which is 3.0 times 10 to the 8. Let's just uh, divide that by the energy, which is equal to 8.2 times 10 to the power of minus 14. And if we were to input this into a scientific calculator, we are going to get approximately 2.43 times 10 to the power of minus 12 meters. Okay, folks, now just to recap, there are two types of matter, matter and antimatter. Uh, they have exactly the same mass, but they have an opposite charge. When matter and antimatter interact, they annihilate, producing photons. We could use delta E is equal to delta mc squared to calculate the energy of the photons. There's two of them to conserve momentum. If we wanted to, we could use E is equal to HC or lambda to calculate the maximum wavelength of these photons, which in this case for the electron positron collision is about 2.43 times 10 to the power of minus 12. If we wanted to, we could also use E is equal to HF to calculate the minimum frequency as well. Hopefully this makes sense. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.